Okay. Welcome to a special edition of Rockford Reading Daily. We are going to read The Souls of Black Folk by W.E.B. Du Bois. I am reading this on Facebook Live at the same time that I am recording this podcast. So I'm going to try to get the audio figured out good enough where I can be heard on Facebook Live and that I can also not be too loud on the recording. So bear with me. If you, I would estimate the majority of people who's going to watch this reading are going to watch this in retrospect. So I hope the audio is right. But if it's not, what I'm going to do is I'm going to replace the video, visual audio with the podcast audio. So this is what we're doing for this Rafford Reading Daily. We are going to read The Souls of Black Folk by W.E.B. Du Bois. We're reading this book specifically because it is a Juneteenth celebration going on in Rockford, Illinois. There are Juneteenth celebrations going on all over. Thank you, Bobby. Juneteenth celebrations going on all over America. There are more people this year paying attention or figuring, learning about Juneteenth than there was last year or the year before, and the same thing will go on for the next however many so years as this becomes a more broader and broader holiday and uh, events. What I think is important, which I addressed on the a podcast episode ago for anybody who's listening to the podcast and on the previous live or for anybody who's watching this live, is the importance of not romanticizing holidays and not romanticizing the current uh, situations that we are in as a society, as a community, as a people. And so I am going to, as an action, to acknowledge the importance of Juneteenth and the historical significance of Juneteenth, but also in an effort to be combative towards the oppression, exploitation, and marginalization and subjugation of black people that exist in America today, read The Souls of Black Folk, and we will have a, do a, our regular Rockford reading routine where I read a segment and dissect the segment and then keep reading and back on and so on and so forth. Only difference is we'll just do, uh, I'll just keep reading it until I feel like I can't read it no more today. So hopefully that's not like 10 pages and then I'm done. But I will say, if something too crazy happened. All right. All right, and it's, we outside too. Let me see. I'm already, I gotta remember, I gotta remember that I get the inclination to be loud in this video audio. I gotta remember to not do that. I gotta get the mic far enough away. Okay, so let's begin with the introduction on the souls of black folk. Anybody who might be watching it alone, just let me know if the audio is not good. Introduction. The task of, quote, introducing, end quote, the souls of black folk is an awesome one for at least two reasons. First, there's the historical and literary significance of the text itself. As the distinguished scholar Arnold Ramsford notes, quote, if all of a nation's literature may stem from one book, as Hemingway implied about the adventures of Huckleberry Finn, then it can as accurately be said that all of Afro-American literature of a creative nature has proceeded from Du Bois' comprehensive statement on the nature of people and the souls of black folk, end quote. Second, a number of brilliant minds have already written about the souls of black folk. Among them, Rampersad, Nathan Huggins, Herbert Apothecker, Cornell West, Eric Sundquist, Hazel Carby, Manning Marble, Houston Baker, Robert Stepto, and Henry Louis Gates. That so many distinguished writers have focused attention on the souls of black folk is only one... Uh, lost my spot, my fault. That so many distinguished writers have focused attention on the souls of black folk is only one measure of the continuing importance of this collection of 14 essays by one of the major thinkers of the 20th century. Clearly, a book of such complexity and magnitude demands and can withstand a number of diverse readings. Since its publication in the spring of 1903, The Souls of Black Folk has become a founding text of African American studies. Its insistence on an interdisciplinary understanding, understanding of black life, on historically grounded and philosophically sound analysis, 
on the scholar's role as advocate and activist, and on the close study of the cultural products, products of the objects of examination, all became tenets of the study of black life in the United States. In its insistence that any understanding of the United States has to be attentive to the contributions and struggles of black Americans, Souls has also contributed to a revision of American history and culture. Furthermore, in recent years, the book has spoken to students of post-colonial and critical race studies as well. However, the text was never meant for a purely academic audience, and perhaps here lies its greatest contribution. It is a brilliant, multifaceted, learned book addressed to an intelligent lay audience as a means of informing social and political action. Dubois' best-known intellectual contributions are introduced here. Quote, double consciousness, end quote, the talented tenth, which is also in quotations, and quote, the veil, end quote. In the Dubois versus Washington debate, that has characterized our understandings of black leadership throughout the 20th century continue to be the major contributions of the text, and they have been explored and written about at length. With these concepts, Dubois provided a basic vocabulary and foundational language for scholars and students of African American history and culture. Double consciousness defines a psychological sense experienced by African Americans whereby they possess a national identity an American one, within a nation that despises their racial identity, a Negro. It also refers to the ability of black Americans to see themselves only through the eyes of white Americans, to measure their intelligence, beauty, and sense of self-worth by standards set by others. Dubois defined the talented tenth as, quote, leadership of the Negro race in America by a trained few, end quote. In The Souls of Black Folk, he envisions this educated elite at the vanguard of racial uplift. Later in his life, he disavowed this theory. Okay, hold on. I'm not gonna lie. I smoked a blunt right before I did this. I, always, I, I smoke a lot before some of the readings would be having my, would be giving me cotton mouth. But usually, uh, as of late, I've been recording them audibly, so you can't visually see the cotton mouth, so I can get by with it a little longer. But I can't get by with the cotton mouth with the camera run. Go fuck yourself, you racist piece of shit! Uh, sorry about that. So, listen, man. I'm people not talking to me however they want to talk to me. It's not gonna happen. All right, I was finna dissect what I just read, and then my mans came by and did that, so. All right, let's keep going. Dubois' ideas have been explored in detail, but only recently through the efforts of black feminist writers such as Hazel Carby, Joy James, Beverly Guy Scheftel, and Nellie McKay, has his notion of black leadership as fundamentally masculine received scholarly attention. These writers have opened up new ways of reading the souls of black folk. Another distinctive feature of the book is Dubois' consistent use of the first person, his assertion of himself as a subjective student of and participant in black life and culture. In the opening pages, he introduces himself to his reader in the following manner, quote, and finally, need I add that I who speak here am a bone of the bone and flesh of the flesh of them that live within the veil. End quote. With this Old Testament illusion, Dubois establishes his relationship to the people about whom he writes as one of sacred matrimony, of man to woman, of husband to wife. In Genesis 2.23, Adam says of Eve, quote, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. End quote. Dubois' use of the veil, the enduring metaphor of the book, not only refers to that which separates black from white, to that through which black folk peer at the world, but it might also be the veil that covers women's faces in many religious traditions. So those who live beneath the veil, the black folk, might be gendered as female, ever mysterious, unknowing, and unknowable, while the black elite, intellectuals and leaders, are gendered male. Dubois promis promises readers that he has, quote, stepped within the veil, end quote, and raised it to expose, quote, deeper recesses, end quote. 
While he elsewhere claims to have lived behind the veil throughout his life, here he positions himself as someone who dwells both within and just outside his cover. And, most important, as the investigator, the communicator, the native informant who can render the mysteries behind the veil known. The 14 chapters that follow this promise represent Dubois' best efforts to make known the strivings and yearnings of black folk in the United States of America. In the first nine chapters, all of which were revised from previously published essays, Dubois turns to academic fields of knowledge such as history, sociology, and philosophy to assist in its interpretation of the complexity of black lives. While these fields help to provide the framework for his analysis, his prose is shaped by biblical and mythological narrative, metaphor, and illusion. In the last five chapters, only one of which have been published previously, though they are still informed by philosophy, sociology, and history, Dubois turns to El Elegy, 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 I've never seen that word before, poetry, religion, and song. In doing so, he attempts to better understand and express the longings of those who live beneath the veil. Consequently, he turns his critical eye to black people and their culture in an effort to comprehend how they have made sense of the absurdity of their situation. And yet, there is something that remains as alien to him as the lyrics he recalls hearing as a child, lyrics passed down from a West African female ancestor. Oh man, I cannot read that. Well, I don't know what to say. And uh, I don't know what they say. <laughs> Damn, that's crazy. It's like uh, I don't know if this is like patois or I'm not sure what it is. I'm not sure what this is. I don't know. Pat patois not from Africa. I'm tweaking. Yeah, my fault. I don't know what this is. I'm gonna just have to pass. Uh, continue past it. And, Man, it's a long introduction. All right. I'm going to read this next paragraph, and then we have a reflection. Uh, as Dubois renders these lyrics and transcribes the melody, they appear as a modified blues form with the repetition of the first two lines before the resolution of the third. Furthermore, he transcribes the songs in the complex, dark key of D-flat, a key that is favored by African-American improvisers and that is quite distinct from the paradig... Paradig... Paradigmatic? Paradigmatic key of C. Of the song he writes, quote, 200 years it has traveled down to us. Damn, what's going on? Oh, this is a car. I thought this was a motorcycle. Uh, it was a motorcycle. Okay, my fault. Mm, look, I done lost my page. The dude coming by saying that but saying that goofy, goofy shit to me in the truck didn't throw me off some. I was just about to do a, a reflection and I just had to like keep reading because I couldn't. Man, I've been doing a lot of these recordings for the readings in the uh, inside of places because of the amount of audio that come with being out in the street. And so I'm trying to get back used to The, the background background noise. Okay, let me get back to our, part, our space. Quote, 200 years this is, it has traveled down to us and we sing it to our children, knowing as little as our fathers what its words may mean, but knowing well the meaning of its music, end quote. Later he names it the voice of exile. David Levering Lewis, Dubois' biographer, notes that the song's lyrics have stumped linguists but his own research suggests that it may be a, quote, Wolof song from Senegambia about captivity and confinement. Gin me, gin me, get me out, get me out. One gets the sense that the connection to the ancestors' music is similar to the New Englander Dubois' relationship to those rural southern black folk he discovers for the first time in the summer of his 18th year when, as a rising junior at Fisk University, he seeks summer employment as a teacher in the hills of Tennessee. This is documented in the book's fourth chapter, quote, of the meaning of progress.
The young Dubois, who first encounters the rural blacks he has deemed bone of his bone and flesh of his flesh, had had little if any contact with the culture of more than 90 percent of African Americans prior to his first trip south. Born in Great Barrington, Massachusetts, on February 23, 1868, three years after the end of the Civil War, and reared in the predominantly white New England town, which could boast but 30 black families, during a period when the American South was going through reconstruction and its aftermath, the young Dubois experienced little of this national drama during his childhood. A descendant of Tom Burghardt, an enslaved African who likely won his freedom after fighting in the Battle of Yorktown during the War of Independence, and of generations of free, property-owning blacks, the precocious Dubois' intellectual talents were early recognized and nurtured by his maternal family as well as by black and white members of his community. Though the color line did exist in Great Barrington, and though his family experienced economic instability after the death of his grandfather and his father's mysterious desertion, the young Dubois' life was distinctly different from the lives of those Southern blacks he would encounter as a young adult. University, the most prestigious black, excuse me, Fisk University, the most prestigious black institution of higher education, gave him his first opportunity to meet a large number of young blacks, many of whom constituted the mulatto elite. The institution served as a threshold to the complex and foreign culture he would attempt to render in the souls of black folk. Okay. Let me try to have a reflection now. So, I have, I got this book for the first time in 2017, 2017, 2017. I was working two jobs at the time, working at Forever 21 and working at Toys R Us. I worked at Toys R Us overnight. And I had got this book and I was reading it on my breaks. And... Uh, different periods in my life I've always like tried I've always tried to regularly be in the habit of reading something and so I've picked up reading different things at different points in my life and at that point in my life when I was reading this I was completely ignorant to the historical importance of the book I was completely ignorant to uh, I was completely I just wasn't politically conscious uh, and there are certain things that if you aren't politically conscious, you can read them or watch them or observe them or hear about them, and they do not resonate with you on the level in which they're supposed to or in which they would if you were, con if you were politically conscious. Uh, and so when 2020 happened and I began to actively begin to read, get different pieces of literature about police terrorism, mass incarceration and racial injustice, and different pieces of literature began to be donated to the organization through the years. This was a book that I personally added uh, that I had before uh, all of that began. And I had always wanted to get back and read this again with a more aware mind with a more a, a conscious politically conscious mind and one of the things that I've encountered throughout different books that I've read throughout different essays that I've read throughout my learning of these issues of police terrorism mass incarceration and racial injustice is a constant call back to W.E.B. Du Bois and even more specifically to this book here The Souls of Black Folk uh, So I say that to say, uh, I, 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 I don't believe in coincidences. So uh, I, you, but I do believe in irony. I don't know if you cannot believe in irony. It's not really like a belief-based thing. But ironically enough, I, I think that me having this book comes full circle. I have been looking for a specific reason to read it. I have been looking for a way to try to actively start doing these video recordings of readings again. We've been putting out the Rafa for Reading daily every day still, and this will basically be part of that. It'll just basically be a bonus Rafa for Reading daily that uh, I put out here for specifically for Juneteenth. And this is a book I think is important to be taught in Juneteenth or taught during Juneteenth. I think that... Uh, and so those are some of my first thoughts as I'm reading through this first couple of pages is that I do understand the importance of this book, and I didn't understand the importance of it when I first... Uh, got it. And I understand the importance of, 
I knew W.E.B. Du Bois, I knew the name, but at the time, I didn't really know the importance of it, of him as an individual and what he provide, what he contributed to the collective struggle. Now, what I will say is this. Some of the concepts that they're speaking about in here, I'll wait till we begin to read them in full and in totality to comment on those. Let's see. Trying to find where I left off at. Okay, here we go. In 1888, Dubois earned his bachelor's degree from Fisk, and in 1890, he earned a second bachelor's from Harvard. He studied for two years in Berlin at Friedrich Wilhelm University. During his time there, he traveled throughout Europe and for the first time in his life experienced life free of American racial politics. In 1895, he became the first African-American to receive a Ph.D. from Harvard. His dissertation in history was published a year later as The Suppression of the African Slave Trade to the United States of America, 1638 through 1870, the first volume of the prestigious Harvard Historical Monograph series. Dubois' first teaching position took him to another black institution, Wilberforce College in Ohio, where he met and married his wife, Nina Gormer. In 1896, he moved to Philadelphia to complete the research for a book that would become one of the first American sociological studies, The Philadelphia Negro, A Social Study, 1899. Oh, the audio went out. Let me see. Unable to gain employment in elite white institutions, such as the University of Pennsylvania, in 1897, Dubois headed south again to begin his tenure at yet another school for African Americans, Atlanta University. While at Atlanta, he oversaw the production of 16 reports on the economic, political, and cultural conditions of black life. During this period, he wrote most of the essays that would become The Souls of Black Folk. The Souls of Black Folk introduced a unique and singularly eloquent voice to contemporary discourse on race in the United States. It appeared at a time when, quote, separate but equal, end quote, had been ruled to be law of the land in the infamous Plessy versus Ferguson decision of 1896. Black Southerners had been successfully disenfranchised and were suppressed economically, socially, and politically through Jim Crow segregation, sharecropping, and tenant farming, debt peonage, and the rise of the chain gang. If this were not enough, they were systematically terrorized by white supremacist organizations such as the Ku Klux Klan. Thousands of blacks were lynched between 1880 and 1920. In the midst of all of this, their supposed racial inferiority was taken for granted in popular culture and academic discourse. Thomas Dixon's white supremacist play, The Leopard Spots, appeared on Broadway to large audiences in 1903. And in 1905, Dixon published the best-selling The Klansman, the basis for D.W. Griffith's film The Birth of a Nation, and a praise song to the Ku Klux Klan. This is the context that gave birth to Souls. By the time he published The Souls of Black Folk, Dubois had established himself as a major scholar and social scientist with an international reputation. He was widely recognized as one of the nation's most highly educated citizens and as the leading scholar of black life in the United States. Throughout his early academic career, Dubois remained convinced of the role reason, the social sciences, and academic research might play in the eradication of racial ignorance and prejudice. In 1898, he wrote, quote, At such a time, true lovers of humanity can only hold higher the pure ideals of science and continue to insist that if we would solve a problem, we must study it, and that there is but one coward on earth, and that is the coward that dare not know. End quote. Dubois, Dubois in the study of Negro problems. Living in the American South, where his young son died in 1899 of narsophenigo diphtheria, having been denied the medical attention of white doctors, where the black farm worker Sam Jose was brutally lynched, burned, and mutilated in the same year, and where the Atlanta riots of 1906 destroyed a middle-class black community and killed both blacks and whites, Dubois came to question the sufficiency of academic knowledge alone 
to address the problems facing those who lived within the veil. Within the pages of the souls of black folk, we see a lingering belief in the power of academic knowledge to invoke social change and in the possibility offered by contact between, quote, the best of the black race and the best of whites, end quote. However, ultimately, Souls is a book about a people's thwarted yearnings for political freedom, economic and educational opportunity, and the free expression of their humanity. Misguided leadership, mob violence, racial ignorance, and governmental neglect frustrate these desires. African Americans' frustrations are best expressed in the failure of Reconstruction, the rise of industrial education, and the tragic figures of Dubois' deceased child and Alexander Crummel and the fictional John. But perhaps the greatest metaphor of thwarted desire lies in the text women and their cries for freedom. The grandmother's captivity song, Josie's desire for higher education in, quote, of meaning of progress, end quote, and Jenny's intellectual longings, to which even the author is incapable of giving full expression in, quote, of the coming of John, end quote. These women are ultimately the black folk, not the exceptional intellectuals Crummel and John, or the chosen and sacrificed golden boy child, and certainly not Dubois himself. The women come closest to representing the longing for freedom, for intellectual and artistic expression, and for transcendence that Dubois finds best expressed in black religion and song. Dubois introduces us to Josie in, quote, of the meaning of progress, end quote. Quote, she was a thin, homely girl of 20, with a dark brown face and thick, hard hair, end quote. She enthusiastically tells Dubois that, quote, she herself longed to learn, and thus she ran on, talking fast and loud with much earnestness and energy, end quote. She is his introduction to the, quote, folk, end quote, as well as the one who will facilitate Dubois' navigation of this new landscape. Before long, he is boarding with her family. Oh, no, brother, gotta get some water. Uh, water bottle have failed. Dang, that probably was loud in the mic. I'm sorry. <clears throat> Josie, quote, oh, oh, wait. Josie seemed to be the center of the family, always busy at service or at home or berry picking. She had about her a certain fineness, the shadow of an unconscious moral heroism that would willingly give all life to make life broader, deeper, and fuller for her and hers. In other words, Josie, who emerges from the folk, has all of the qualities of a leader who emerges from her people. But she is prevented from realizing her ambitions, not for lack of desire or the willingness to work, but because she is the economic and spiritual backbone of her family. When Dubois returns to visit the family a decade following his last summer with them, he learns of Josie's premature death. Dubois's description of her death is not the elegant prose elegiac, elegiac prose that characterizes, quote, of the passing of the firstborn, end quote, or, quote, of Alexander Crummel, end quote. Elegy is reserved for the extraordinary. Yet, somehow, Josie's death marks the truest tragedy of black folk. The lack of opportunity to take advantage of the small possibilities that might exist. The potential for leadership and accomplishment that is never realized. Quote, how shall man measure progress there where the dark-faced Josie lies? End quote. Asked Dubois. If Josie represents the thwarted aspirations of black folk, then their religion bears the immensity of their hope. Wisely, Dubois recognizes the impossibility of truly knowing black Southerners without attempting to understand the power of their faith, even while he is overwhelmed by his terrible, frightening beauty. Chapter 10 quote, of the faith of the fathers, end quote, is the first systematic discussion of the history of the black church and the power of religious faith in the lives of black Americans. Dubois astutely argues that, quote, it is clear that the study of Negro religion is not only a vital part of the history of the Negro in America, but no uninteresting part of American history, end quote. And that for the people who are listening to the podcast and for anybody who may watch this who's listening to the Rafa Reading Daily Podcast, one of the books that we've been reading is Sister Citizen. And there was a chapter specifically 
reserved a sister citizen to acknowledge the role that religion played in black women's experiences in America. And so, again, one of the things we're trying to do with one of the things we're trying to do with the Rockford Reading Daily series is to sort of build a curriculum and a base for people to go and learn about police terrorism, mass incarceration, and racial injustice. And so I'm trying to figure out where do we I'm trying to figure out where do I end this podcast episode at. Alright, I got an ambulance coming, so I'm gonna I'm going to just pause it here. Dubois opens the chapter by posting his own cultural and spiritual distance from rural black worshipers. It is worth quoting at length. Quote, It was out in the country, far from home, far from my foster home, on a dark Sunday night. The road wandered from my rambling log house up the stony bed of a creek, past wheat and corn, until we could hear dimly across the fields a rhythmic cadence of song, soft, thrilling, powerful, that swelled and died sorrowfully in our ears. I was a country school teacher then, fresh from the East, and had never seen a Southern Negro revival. To be sure, we in Berkshire were not perhaps as stiff and formal as they in Suffolk of olden time, yet we were very quiet and subdued, And I know not what would have happened those clear Sabbath mornings had someone punctuated the sermon with a wild scream or interrupted the long prayer with a loud amen. And so most striking to me, as I approached the village in the little plain church perched aloft, was the air of intense excitement that possessed that mass of black folk. A sort of suppressed terror hung in the air and seemed to seize us, a Pythian madness. A a demoniac... Demon, I don't know if it's demonic. It's like demoniac. Yeah, demoniac possession that lent terribly reality. That lent terrible reality to song and word. Okay, let me try that sentence again. I butchered that sentence. A sort of suppressed terror hung in the air and seemed to seize us. A Pythian madness, a demoniac possession that lent terrible reality to song and word. The black and massive form of the preacher swayed and quivered as the words crowded to his lips and flew at us in singular eloquence. The people moaned and fluttered, and then the gaunt-cheeked brown woman beside me suddenly leaped straight into the air and shrieked like a lost soul, while round about me came wail and groan and outcry in a scene of human passion such as I had never conceived before. End quote. The paragraph opens with the description of physical distance, quote, far, end quote, quote, from, end quote, end quote, past, end quote. Soon this physical distance will give way to cultural, experiential distance, not just the space, but also time. Note the adjectives used to describe expressions of religious fervor, quote, wild, end quote, quote, loud, end quote, quote, madness, demoniac possession, terrible terror all in quotations. Again, he closes with, quote, such as I had never conceived before, end quote. Not only is this a scene he has never witnessed, it is even beyond his powers of imagination. When Dubois writes, quote, so most striking striking to me was the air of intense excitement that possessed that mass of black folk, end quote, it is an excitement that will infect him, but he remains outside, apart and distant from it. In this way, he is not unlike the character Cadmus in Gene Toomer's classic novel, Cain, 1923, or the historical figures Charlotte Forden and Rebecca Primus, northern black teachers working in the South, who all differ from Richard Wright and James Baldwin, both of whom describe such religious rituals as critical participants. For Dubois, the scene is, quote, awful, end quote. However, Throughout the chapter, he provides an eloquent and forceful history of the black church as a political and social institution capable of containing the strivings of the mass of black people, and he insists upon its importance in the development of the people and of the nation. He recognizes the power of this faith and its potential to sweep them, quote, out of the valley of the shadow of death, end quote, beyond the veil. Until that day, it seems that the only way to transcend a place where, 
quote, all that makes life worth living, living, liberty, justice, and right is marked for white people only, end quote. It's death itself, the subject of the two chapters that follow, quote, of the passing of the firstborn, end quote, and quote, of Alexander Crummel, end quote. Both of these give us portraits of the lives and deaths of extraordinary individuals whose lives are crushed by the injustices of a racist society. Uh, sorry, I had to get something to drink. One whose promise is thwarted before he has time to grow up, and the other who meets resistance at every turn. Crummel must confront three temptations as he tries to realize his potential. The temptation of hate, the temptation of despair, and the temptation of doubt. The last one proves to be the most significant in that it is a doubt of his people's desire and ability to better themselves. As a young priest, quote, the dark young clergyman labored. He wrote his sermons carefully. He intoned his prayers with a soft, earnest voice. He haunted the streets and accosted the wayfarers. He visited the sick and knelt before the dying, end quote. And yet, in spite of his most sincere efforts, his, quote, congregation dwindled, end quote. The best efforts of the learned young man are not enough for his own people to heed his leadership. Dubois follows the sketches of his deceased son and of Alexander Crummel with the only fictional piece in the book, quote, of the coming of John, end quote. A story of a young black intellectual who returns to his southern roots only to find himself unable to communicate with his own people and conceived of as a threat by the whites of his hometown. As with the child Burghardt and the adult Crummel, one here senses that Dubois really knows this figure, identifies with him, and sees himself in the young man's strivings. Dubois makes this connection between himself and John in a number of ways. First, the young John experiences rapture in a northern theater. Quote, he sat in a half maze minding the scene about him, the delicate beauty of the hall, the faint perfume, the moving myriad of men, the rich clothing and low hum of talking seemed all a part of worlds so different from his, so strangely more beautiful than anything he had known, that he sat in dreamland and started when, after a hush, rose high and cleared the music of Longren Swan. The infinite beauty of the well lingered and swept through every muscle of his frame and put it all to tune, end quote. The description is not like Dubois' own experiences during his years in, in Berlin. Furthermore, when John returns south, he attempts to address the black church congregation. John spoke slowly and methodically. A painful hush seized that crowd mass. Little had they understood of what he said, for he spoke an unknown tongue. Then at last, the low suppressed snarl came from the amen corner and an old bent man arose, walked over the seats and climbed straight up into the pulpit. He was wrinkled in black with scant gray and tufted hair. His voice and hands shook as with palsy, but on his face lay the intense rapt look of the religious fanatic. He seized the Bible with his rough, huge hands. Twice he raised it inarticulate and then fairly burst into the words with rude and awful eloquence. He quivered, swayed, and bent, then rose aloft in perfect majesty. Till the people moaned and wept, wailed and shouted, and a wild shrieking arose from the corners where all the pent-up feeling of the hour gathered itself and rushed into the air. John never knew what clearly the old man said. He only felt himself held up to scorn and scathing denunciation for trampling on the true religion and he realized with amazement that all unknowingly he had put rough, rude hands on something this little world had held sacred. End quote. This motorcycle loud as hell. Yeah. Okay. Compare this to Dubois' description of his own first visit to a black southern church. Here the young black intellectual is challenged by the racism of the town's whites and the ignorance of its blacks. He is no longer able to communicate with them, and he fails to respect all that they hold dear. Most important, the folk preacher is frustratingly eloquent and inarticulate. John does not understand him, but the black congregants do. As with, quote, of the passing of the firstborn, end quote, and, quote, of Alexander Crummel, end quote, this chapter two ends with the death of the gifted black man, but not before John murders his former childhood playmate, the white John. 
an act of a black man protecting a black woman, in this case, John's younger sister, from dishonor by a white man leads to the murder of both Johns. It is a trope that returns in later writings by black American artists, most notably Gene Toomer's story, quote, Blood Burning Moon, end quote. Hazel Carby notes, quote, in this struggle over the control of female sexuality and sexual reproduction, John gains self-respect in his own black manhood. The future of Dubois' imagined black community is to be determined by the nature of the struggle among men over the bodies of women, end quote. For Carby, quote, white and black male desires and hopes violently conflict and result in their mutual destruction, end quote. Significantly, Dubois knows and can give voice to John's desires and destruction. For John, like Cromwell and like Dubois, is an ambitious, learned young black man who at times feels an unknowing distance from the flesh of his flesh. Part of the tragedy of John is that his acquisition of knowledge, his brief experience of a different, more intellectual way of life, makes him long for freedom beyond the veil and creates a distance between himself and his community of origin. John leaves his home to attend. Excuse me. John leaves his home to attend a black college. He spends a year in the north to earn extra money, and while there, he experiences life in an unsegregated society. He attends the theater and walks crowded urban streets. He is given the opportunity to taste, if briefly, just what life might be like. However, the truly thwarted desire of this story is that of John's younger sister, Jenny, who follows him from the church on that fateful night. John looks to her, quote, remembering with sudden pain how little thought he had given her, end quote. As she weeps quietly beside him, they have the following exchange. Quote, John, she said, does it make everyone unhappy when they study and learn lots of things? End quote. Quote, I am afraid it does, end quote, he said. Quote, and John, are you glad you studied? End quote. Quote, yes, came the answer, slowly but positively. I wish I was unhappy and, and, putting both arms about his neck, I think I am a little, John, end quote. The younger girl is quietly representative of the yearnings of black folk for opportunity and self-expression. She too shares her brother's understanding of the despair of their lives, but it is not given the opportunity to articulate it. Unlike Crumble or Dubois or John himself, she shares more with Josie, who embodies both the love of her people, a connection to them, a sense of responsibility for them, and the yearning to know, to live, which will be forever denied her. She remains inarticulate, unable to express her longings and desires. When accosted by the white John, she, quote, stared at him in surprise and confusion, faltered something inarticulate and attempted to pass, end quote. If death the waste of baby, Burghardt, Crummel, and John, the specter of rape forever haunts the young black woman, and even her protests are ineffective in their inarticulateness. As if trying to address the absence of an articulate statement from the black folk of this book, Dubois closes his famous volume with one of the most eloquent treatments of black song in all literature. The chapter, quote, The Sorrow Songs, end quote, puts forward a highly important and influential theory of black music by paying close attention to both the lyrics and the sound of the spirituals. Dubois writes, quote, I know that these songs are the articulate message of the slave to the world, end quote. And for Dubois, that message is one, quote, of an unhappy people, of the children of disappointment. They tell of death and suffering and unvoiced longing toward a truer world of misty wanderings and hidden ways. End quote. Later, he will write that the slaves' message to the world, quote, is naturally veiled and half articulate, end quote. But this is as much a consequence of language as it is an attempt of the slaves to keep their true longings for freedom and their communication about acquiring it away from their oppressors. In this instance, they are agents of resistance, for the sorrow songs not only communicate a longing for freedom, but they also, quote, breathe a hope, a faith in the ultimate justice of things, end quote. In an important discussion of the book, Anthony Monterio writes, quote, 
Dubois locates the Negro spirituals within the context of the striving for freedom and justice and the realization of a collective self, a peoplehood. He, however, defines the sorrow songs as the central historical narrative of black folk, end quote. For the black folk who created the sorrow songs are not defeated by the temptation of despair, as was the learned priest Crummel. It is not insignificant that this book of the talented tenth of the double consciousness of extraordinary Negroes, of leaders in the lead, ends with the articulation of the folk it has claimed to represent. Even as Dubois' distance from the black folk about whom he writes remains evident throughout this text, The Souls of Black Folk is nonetheless a document of an intellectual activist devoted to the black masses. All right, and that introduction was written by Farrah Jasmine Griffin, and that brings us to the forethought of, in the first pages of The Souls of Black Folk. And I'm going to end this podcast episode now. I want to thank everybody for taking the time to listen along to this episode. This was a little more, a little less conventional than previous episodes. I haven't decided how exactly we're going to put this out, uh, but I am going to do it on a daily basis. I don't want to just like flood a bunch of them. So I think we'll just, I'll just end up putting this out after in, in some order of reading. So uh, bear with us. This one will probably be a little bit. The first few episodes of this one will be a little bit different. Uh, I'm not going to read the entire book outside uh, on June 18th, but I do think it's important to start this this book because of the context of it on this day. So I'll do more reflections and more diving into the content of the literature on the following episodes and I'll do more of dissecting these things on videos, further videos from now on. All right, so I'm going to end all of these and then we will be back shortly on the Facebook Live and we will be back tomorrow for the people listening on the podcast. And remember, we put these episodes of Rock for Reading out on a daily basis to provide people the opportunity to begin and further their journey and the struggle to end police terrorism, mass incarceration, and racial injustice. Uh.